So it is so good to see all of you this morning as we gather together for worship. And I want to say a very special welcome to any guests that we have with us this morning. We're so glad that you are here as well. So glad that God has brought you to this place of worship today. As we enter into that time of worship this morning, I'd like to read for us uh, just one verse, the very first verse of Psalm 146, where the psalmist declares, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God as long as I have breath. You know, I was thinking about that verse, and as I, as I mulled it over in my mind, something came to me. It was uh, from the Westminster Confession, and I don't know how many of us are, are familiar with that at all. It's okay if you're not, but the very first question there asks, what is the chief end of man? What are we here for? And the answer says, to glorify God and just to enjoy Him forever. And what an opportunity to do that right here, right now, to enjoy God, to get a glimpse of what that forever will actually be as we glorify Him. So let's do that. Let's begin in song. Let's stand and sing together.
Well, as we gather in God's presence today, certainly with joy in our hearts, God wants to greet his people, receive his greeting now. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, God has greeted us this morning. I invite you to turn, extend a greeting to those around you today as well. Spirit, I will rise from the 
resurrected King is resurrecting me. you may be seated. Father, we gather before you this morning the people that were raised to life, um, forgiven, um, given a gift that we could never earn or repay because of Christ's life and death and resurrection. And this morning, we pray that you would continue your work of resurrecting us, of cleansing us, of transforming us into the people that, uh, that you created us to be by the power of your Holy Spirit. And in your name we pray. Amen. I want to share with us a moment from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 23 is his will for us his people this morning. Paul writes, he, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, again, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled <clears throat> in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And then these words, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So we pray that by God's grace, by the strength of his spirit, that we do remain steadfast, that we do remain firm, that we continue, and that by God's grace, that we arrive at that place where he wants us to be, that place which is in his very heart. So we're going to sing about that. We're going to commit ourselves to living as God's people right now. Would you rise?
be seated. Well, as we have the opportunity to go before God in a time of prayer together this morning, just a few things to point out to us, uh, things that we need to be aware of. Uh, Announcement-wise, first of all, uh, just to note uh, in your announcement sheet that the Mitten Plus Drive has been going on now for a little bit, but now we're kind of looking toward the end of November is when we're going to wrap that up. So if you've got new mittens, gloves, other uh, warm apparel uh, that you would be able to donate to please do that, and then we'll get to those uh, who are in need of that this time of year. So take special note of that. Uh, then also, uh, an announcement for our Sunday school kids, uh, age uh, grades first through fifth, uh, to remind you to go to the gathering room right after the service today. You've got some more card making to do, uh, so keep that in mind, and parents of those kids, keep that in mind too, and the kids can gather there following the service. Then also a correction on the announcement sheet, our shepherding elders meeting is not on Thursday this week, it is on Tuesday this week. So just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. So then as we think about some prayer items, some things going on, just a little update on Miss Go. Uh, She did have her surgery to take out part of that thyroid, dealing with that thyroid cancer, and she is doing as well as she can. So we're very grateful to that or for that, and we pray that God would continue to uh, bless her with healing. Uh, Keep in mind uh, also in your thoughts and prayers, uh, Bob Ritzma, he's got a couple of appointments coming up this week. Uh, Just pray for a calmness of spirit. Pray for good results uh, from those appointments as well. And then I am also uh, pleased to let everybody know that Brett and Rachel Brink, welcome to their newest addition this past Friday, uh, Ezekiel Thomas. And he was 7 pounds, 14 ounces, and... Baby and mom and everyone else are doing great. So they are so very thankful to God. So let's go to our God in a time of prayer together. Most merciful God and Heavenly Father, Lord, how good it is to gather in your presence today and to be here and to acknowledge, even as we sang at the very opening song, that we are people of the risen King That we do not serve a a dead Savior. We serve a risen Lord. And that is why we are here. That is why we can sing our praises. And that is why we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you, O God, hear the praises that we offer. God, we pray that we would receive the worship that we have for today as it comes to us from hearts that are truly glad, hearts that are truly thankful for all that you are and for all that you have done. Lord, we truly want to lift you on high, for you and you alone are highly exalted. Father, we've heard just a moment ago from your word once again, your desire for us to live as your people, to live as people of the risen King. Father, we pray that that call to be steadfast and to be firm in our faith, to remember uh, that that once we were in darkness, but you have brought us into the kingdom of light. We pray that you would help us to continue strongly in our faith. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for the times when we falter and, and when we fail, that you would look upon us in your grace for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. And that you would continue to lead us in the way of righteousness, indeed the way of everlasting life. Father, we stand so amazed at the many wondrous ways that you bless our lives. For each one of us, we could give testimony to this as we we just look over all that you have given to us. We are so thankful for what you have done. Father, that is true individually for each one of us. It is true for us as a church family as well. And not just speaking of the material blessings, but all of the spiritual blessings that you shower down upon us. Father, we pray that particularly in this season of Thanksgiving, even as we anticipate Thanksgiving Day in just a couple of weeks, that we would truly be considering all the many gifts that you have given to us and truly seek to live in gratitude each and every day. 
Father, we are so thankful as well, along with the, the Brink family, Brett and Rachel, their extended family for little Ezekiel, for how he is, is healthy. Father, we pray for your continued hand to be upon him. Father, we pray that you would bless uh, little Ezekiel with health and strength, and Father, help him to grow. And most of all, even as we pray for all of our children, that you would help him to grow and, and to love and to want to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for those who have special needs today. We're aware of some, and we want to continue to be in prayer for Miss Ugo. She recovers from surgery. Father, we pray already for a, a very good report. Uh, she has a follow-up appointment coming up here toward the end of November. We pray that they would get good news. Father, we pray that you would bring a full measure of healing into her body. Be with Bob in the couple of appointments he has this week. Help those to go well. Be with uh, them and give them a, a great sense of peace as they go through this. Father, we pray too for those who recently lost loved ones. We think of Leon Skolton especially right now and the recent loss of his brother. We pray that you would bring uh, comfort and peace into the lives of those who mourn. Remind them, God, of all of your many promises for those who are your people. Father, we as a church family today think of our shut-ins, those who are nursing home residents, those whom we don't get to see from week to week. They are vital members of this body. We pray for them. Father, encourage them today. Remind them that uh, they are part of this body, that we, uh, we are one in Jesus Christ. Father, that you would give to each one what they stand in need of. And Lord, continue to bless our church ministries, we pray. We pray for our littles as they worship and participate uh, in children and worship. We pray for our Sunday school and for Deb as she oversees that. For our gems and our cadets and all of their leaders. For our middle and high school ministries and Kurt as he gives leadership there. For all of our adult ministries and discipleship opportunities. And, and with Noah as he gives leadership in that respect. Father, we ask your blessing. We want to be a faithful congregation. And Father, more than that, we recognize that faithfulness isn't about activity, but faithfulness is about seeking you first and foremost, seeking to be that salt and that light that you have declared us to be, that you want us to be in this community where you have placed us. So, Father, be with us, we pray. Now help us uh, all in that respect to give glory to you every single moment of every single day. Father, help us to bring the light that you have placed into our lives, into the community around us. Father, we know that there are so many needs around us today. And as true as that is in our immediate community, it is certainly true when it comes to our state and our nation and certainly our world. So, Father, we pray that your people around this world would rise up. And that, Father, that they would be able to speak in one voice that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that salvation is found only in him. And that, God, that your Holy Spirit would be preparing hearts to receive that good news of the gospel. Lord, all of this we pray and ask, not because we in ourselves are worthy in any way whatsoever, but we pray and ask this in the name of Jesus, who has qualified us, who brings our prayers to you and through the Holy Spirit, we pray this in his name. Amen. And we have the opportunity to give of our gifts this morning. The offering is for Beautiful Gate. If you are a guest here this morning, again, we welcome you. We're, we're so thankful that you're here. We'd invite you to fill out this, uh, this visitor card. It's in the pew in front of you there and put that uh, in the offering plate as it goes by. We'd really appreciate that. So at this time, let's worship God together as we give of our gifts.
I'd like to invite you to take out your Bibles and turn there with me uh, to Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians at chapter 15. We are continuing this morning once again in a series uh, called Hope, a series subtitled Your Heart's Deepest Longing. And today we think about resurrection. So obviously, we would turn to 1 Corinthians at chapter 15. You'll find this on page 1,142. Now, I'm going to read this entire chapter, so I'd really invite you to follow along as I read that. Here the Apostle Paul writes, is carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, by the way, which is Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one to untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed." Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for as by man came death, By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. 
when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same. But there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual, spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed." For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Well, congregation, there is an old saying that is as true today as it was when it was first coined. Uh, it was said by Benjamin Franklin in a letter that he wrote to Jean-Baptiste Leroy in 1789. Franklin wrote, In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except, uh, you know the words, right? Say them with me. Death and taxes. As I mentioned, that little saying really is as true today as it was when Franklin first wrote it, because really there's no way around those things, right? Everyone has to pay taxes, and everyone is destined for death. Now, there's not many of us who like paying taxes, 
but none of us like death. We don't like thinking about death, right? We don't like hearing about death. We don't like facing death. Death just isn't something that we like, and for good reason, really. As the Bible tells us here, death is an intruder, right? Death isn't normal, right? It wasn't part of God's good creation. As Genesis chapter 3 tells us, death only came on the scene after Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. So death wasn't part of God's original design. Death is an intruder. Death is an enemy. All of us have tasted death. That is to say, all of us have been touched by death. We've all lost people that were close to us, people that we loved. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a spouse. Perhaps it was a, a grandparent or a dear friend. Maybe it was even a child. We've tasted death. And it doesn't taste good. In fact, it leaves a, a horrible taste in our mouth. And that really, no matter the circumstances, right, whether that, that death was sudden and unexpected or whether that death was, was rather slow and perhaps even anticipated, death doesn't taste good, understandably so, because it seems to be so final, doesn't it? Right? We, we put the body of our loved one in a casket. We, we put that casket six feet under the ground, and we don't see our loved one anymore. Right? From all appearances, it seems as though death is the end. But as Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, death is not the end for a believer in Jesus. Now, it is the closing of a chapter. There's no doubt about that, but it is not the end of the story. Death does not have the final word. In fact, God has the final word. And that word, as Paul very clearly declares in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that word is resurrection. And this is the ultimate victory for the believer in Jesus. So let's take a look. Let's take a closer look at this wonderful, hope-filled, and certainly biblical teaching of the resurrection as Paul presents it for us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which very often is simply referred to as the resurrection chapter. So as we look at this chapter, Paul begins his discussion of our eventual resurrection from the dead by reminding us of Jesus' resurrection, which, as Paul says, is the very heart of the gospel message. It is the very center of the good news that he's been proclaiming, right? As Paul puts it here in our text, he says, for I delivered to you as of first importance, he says, here is the primary thing. This is what I delivered to you. I received it as well, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at one time. Then he also appeared to James and to all the apostles. And then, says Paul, finally he also appeared to me as one who was untimely born. Now, Paul's point in all of this is to underscore the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Now, I guess we need to step back for just a moment, considering what Paul says here, and ask the question, well, what do we need to have in order to have a reputable resurrection? What do we need to have? Well, we need a couple of things, right? First of all, we need a dead body, right? So we need to understand that Jesus really died. Because Paul, in our text and in his gospel message, he is not proclaiming a resuscitation. He is claiming a resurrection. And so we need a dead body. We need to understand that Jesus really died. And that's exactly what we have here with Jesus, says Paul, on the cross of Calvary, that he really died. That he didn't just pass out. He didn't just faint. He really died. In fact, not only did he die, says Paul, but he also includes this little tidbit, that he was buried. Well, you only bury a dead 
body. Right, so he says, listen, Jesus, resurrect, uh, Jesus' death, it is absolutely an undisputed fact. That's the first thing you need to have. To have a reputable resurrection, you need to have a dead body. That's what we have in Jesus. But secondly, as he points out, in terms of a, a reputable resurrection, you also need to have proof of life. And so that's why Paul takes some time here and he says, hey, here's all the witnesses. And he lists them through, right? And I think what we need to recognize here is that in terms of this list, Paul's not only saying, well, he just appeared to his inner circle, as if they might have something to gain by this in some way. Paul says, no, he appeared to his apostles, but he also appeared to many other people. And in fact, not just a few people, a whole bunch of people. Right, over 500 people. And as Paul says, at the time that he wrote this, he says, hey, some of them are still alive. You want to know about it? You want to hear about it? Go talk to them. They'll tell you the same thing. So as much as Jesus' death is an undisputable fact, says Paul, so is his resurrection. In fact, as I was reading that, I was thinking again of Someone I came to know about a long time ago, his name is Lee Strobel. Maybe some of you know Lee in his, one of his first books, The Case for Christ. Maybe you're familiar with that book. Maybe you've seen the movie. It came out in movie form a year or so ago. And here's, here's Lee, and he's an uh, uh, investigative reporter, and he's, a, he's an atheist. And his wife became a Christian, so he sets out to use all of his gifts and talents so as to disprove her, to say Christianity is a hoax. And he says he's focused in on the resurrection because if he could disprove that, then everything would crumble. And so he did interview after interview and he examined all the evidence and he puts it in her. And finally he says, after looking at all the evidence for Christ's resurrection, it would take more faith for me to believe that Jesus didn't rise from the dead than to believe that he did. Now, the main reason that Paul begins his resurrection chapter here is because Jesus' resurrection is the proof and the guarantee of our eventual resurrection, the eventual resurrection of those who believe in Jesus. In fact, as Paul says, if Jesus never rose from the grave, if Jesus is still in the tomb today, his body is there it has decayed and it has turned to dust. He says effectively to all of those who, who are followers of Jesus, says, well, you, as may, you may as well just pack it in. You may as well just go along with the bandwagon of all of those who say, hey, let's eat and drink and be merry. Let's make the most of today because tomorrow, you know, we may not be here. Tomorrow we're going to die. In other words, we may as well give up hope. I mean, after all, as Paul says here, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. In fact, he goes so far as to say that if only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied above all people. And you hear what Paul is saying here, right? This is what he's saying. If Jesus never rose from the dead, then our faith in him is worthless because he's a liar. How many times, how many times in the gospel accounts did Jesus say to those who were around him, his followers and others, listen, he says, I'm going to die, and in three days I'm going to rise again. How many times? Multiple times in the gospel accounts. But if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, if he didn't keep his word, then we can't believe anything he ever said. In fact, everything that he said would have to be taken with more than a grain of salt. And anybody who followed him, anybody who committed their life to his cause, we would consider absolutely crazy. But in fact, as Paul so magnificently declares it here in verse 20, 
Christ has been raised from the dead. And he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So in stark contrast to the hopelessness of Jesus' death and decay, Paul declares the wonder and the hope of Jesus' resurrection, namely the reality that just as Jesus rose from the dead, that we also, those who know him and who love him and who trust him as Savior, we also will rise from the dead. Right, as Paul says, for as in Adam all die, so as all who are in Christ shall be made alive, but each in his own order, right? Christ, the first fruits. He's the first one. Here's the, he's the example. He's the prototype. Christ, the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to to him. Right? The reality is, says Paul, our preaching is not useless. Our faith is not futile. Why? Because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And because he's been raised, then we know that we also, those who are his followers, we also will be raised from the dead. Death is not the end of the story. For those who belong to Jesus. Now, our bodies may be buried, but we will not stay six feet under forever. We will rise again when the time is right. As Paul says, when Jesus comes again to destroy all of his enemies, including that last enemy, which of course is death. Now, Paul could have stopped his writing right here, right? He could have ended chapter 15 here on this glorious note of our eventual resurrection. He could have just stopped it right here, but he doesn't do that, right? He goes on to talk about the resurrection body. And this really is a fascinating part of 1 Corinthians at chapter 15, right? He says, with what kind of body do they come? You ever thought about that? You ever wondered what your resurrection body is going to be like? Now, Paul doesn't give us all the particulars here, but he does share with us three very significant things about our resurrection bodies. What he, in verse 44, labels a spiritual body as opposed to a natural body. And what we need to understand with using that language, because language is always fussy, right? But we need to understand that when Paul talks about a spiritual body as our resurrection body, he's not talking about a non-material body. He's not talking about the fact that, that as we're raised to life, right, at, at that time when Jesus comes back, that we're going to be some kind of ghost or something like that. No, he's using that word spiritual as opposed to natural to say this is going to be a supernatural body. It's going to be new and improved. So in other words, when it comes to our resurrection bodies, going to, there's going to be some continuity with our current body, but at the same time, there's going to be some significant change. And that change is encapsulated in three words that Paul uses here in our text. Those words are imperishable and glorious and powerful. Right? This is what he says in verses 42 and 43. What is sown, speaking about a dead body, what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. So imperishable, glorious, and powerful. This is what our resurrection bodies will be like. So if you want to put that just in one word, you can simply say, we are going to be fit. We are going to be fit for a forever life with God. Now, what exactly that looks like, it's still admittedly a mystery, but at a very basic level, our resurrection bodies, just like Jesus' resurrection body, will never deteriorate or decay, and we will no longer be frail and fragile, susceptible to things like illness, sickness, 
disease. We will be fit for a forever life with God. Paul concludes his resurrection chapter by emphasizing once again this ultimate victory that is ours in Christ. This victory over death. This victory that will be ours when Jesus comes again. Because then, as he points out to us very clearly, death is going to be swallowed up in victory. And you and I will be able to sing together with all the saints, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? And what's the implication of all of this for you and me right here, right now? What's the implication? Well, Paul sums it up, doesn't he, in the very last verse, in verse 58? It says, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, be immovable, always be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. One person put it this way, because of Christ's resurrection and our eventual resurrection, we know that serving him is not empty, useless activity. No, our effort, whatever that looks like, Whatever you do for the cause of Christ, whatever you do for his kingdom, our effort is invested in the Lord's winning cause. So in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Well, as true as that is, It is even more true that for the believer in Jesus, that our eventual bodily resurrection is also certain. It is absolutely guaranteed. God in Christ has won the victory. And by His grace, That victory is our victory. What more can we say? Except as Paul says in our text, thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it is just with such joy and encouragement today that we come to you in prayer following this message because we have heard again of this ultimate victory that you give to us in Jesus, the victory over that last and greatest enemy that is death itself, that even though from our earthbound perspective, death appears to be so final, but yet in Christ For those of us who by your grace know and love Jesus as Savior and Lord, death is not the end. But just as Jesus rose from the grave, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that we also will eventually rise again when Jesus returns. So, Father, we stand with such joy and gratitude in our hearts for this wonderful reality. And may it fill our daily lives in the here and now with meaning and purpose because we know that whatever we do for you, it is not in vain. But it is invested in our Lord's winning cause. So Father, may we take this with us today. May it fill us with hope. And may it fill us with energy to serve you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Friends, would you rise if you're able?
God's parting blessing. May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Pray.